So, Barry Barton, um, 20 years. Well, we first came to Australia in 2003. Yes. Uh, when we were invited by um, the Honourable Robert Buckingham for the Melbourne <laughs> Fashion Festival. But I'm trying to remember when we first met and how we first met. I'm not sure I can remember who actually introduced us. Can you remember? Yeah, I can. I think it was maybe 2007 and Robert Buckingham introduced us because I think um, the would extraordinary been, Robert, the future it? laboratory makes on his time while, he, while you're in Australia had got such that he thought he needed some help. And so he called us um, to help you guys with some of the content um, for your trend briefing, which was just the most exciting thing that we had done at that stage of in our course. lives. Of course, yeah. Um, and also help with the, the, um, the organization and the practicals of your trend briefing, which was terrifying for us because I, I don't think we'd really dealt with people who take an audio visual so seriously uh, in our lives. Well, I do remember going up to see you in your super cool office in Curtin House in the yes. CBD in, in Melbourne, and then uh, going to an event with you where we all sat cross-legged on the floor. And I've got a picture actually of Robert looking very, very serious uh, in, 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 a, in a jacket, but cross-legged cross on the floor at some super cool hipster event. Yeah, um, that sounds like a Melbourne then, event. Yeah, and of course, at that point, you you um, had pioneered this whole concept of um, open air cinema on the roof, and were one of the first people, I think, globally to really do this idea of of rooftop cinema in a downtown area. And of course, it was a, a massive success, um, mm -hmm. both for you and and really also obviously for the business that you then that you then created. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, we we were just interested in creating an experience of cinema in an environment to watch cinema, which was just as beautiful as the film, because at that time, and actually sadly still to this day, um, you know, big box cinemas are really disgusting dark rooms with sticky carpet and you have to drink Coca-Cola and, you know, um, eat chocolate. And it just doesn't seem to really kind of match <laughs> the effort that was put in into creating the film. So we, um, yeah, had the idea of occupying a space that was, um, underutilized being the roof of a beautiful old building in the CBD of Melbourne. And we cobbled together a bunch of sponsors to help us kind of fund it in advance and um, opened up something that to our surprise, I think um, really captured people's imagination. And um, yeah, yeah, it's been a, one of our most uh, joyous and simple projects that we've ever worked on. And I mean, if you think back to, to that period, to, to that sort of 2005, 2006, seven hmm. time, uh, how different do you feel looking back at it now it is from where we are now? I'm, I'm obviously forgetting about the coronavirus pandemic, but yeah. But what, what are your what are your striking observations about how different things were then to to how they are now? It's a really good question um, because on one hand things seem radically different, and on the other hand things seem the same. I think mm. probably the, the main thing that's changed with those kind of cultural experiences is actually the advent of social media. I remember when we started Rooftop Cinema, you know, I, I think it was season two that we set up a MySpace profile and that seemed like a very progressive new thing to do. Um, and we had no idea that um, in our, like the immediate future, um, people would be getting advice on what to do with their time and their money and where to go from their friends rather than authoritative newspapers and, and you know, fully fledged websites that have been set up. And that really kind of changed the way that we understood our city um, and explored our city. And I think quite sadly, turned a lot of our exploration into somewhat of a, a matter of popularity. You know, I think the way that the internet and social media generally works is that things that are popular become more popular and the things that are unpopular get repressed. And so um, to me, it seems like a lot easier to find out about the things that um, happen in your city, but they're generally more obvious and predictable. Whereas in those days, you would just kind of roam the streets and bump into people. And, um, you know, I don't want to be too sentimental about that, but the, you know, the spontaneity of those times I really kind of miss, I suppose. Yeah. But, um, you know, here we are in, in 2020, which is quite some, you know, it's 15 years ago uh, or 13 years since we launched that cinema. And I think the core human drivers remain the same. And we really love um, seeing ourselves in the people and the environments in which we, you know, spend time. Um, we really love feeling proud of our city, which is really what the cinema was kind of about. Um, 
you know, here we are in a building in the middle of Melbourne looking around and feeling like it's this kind of sophisticated global thing. Um, and, and so it I was. guess for a lot of our business, I feel like we're appealing to the same ideas um, and same kind of impulses that we were 15 years ago. So it doesn't seem that different. Well, it's interesting you say that because, the, the, you know, it, it does become apparent that there's this really key thread that runs through all of your business activities and how it's developed over the years because it it appears up from the outside as if it, there's been quite a lot of meandering in terms of the route that you've taken. Yeah. <laughs> Excuse me. Bless you. But, but in, a, in essence, you've always been about cities and both the space and how people use them. Yeah. Um, and the, the way in which you've looked at that journey, I think, has been fascinating. And one of the early other early things that Right Angle did was the, the Thousands Guide, which yeah. really helped, I think, um, a whole load of people to understand this this kind of new sense of wayfinding mm. um, in a city by providing guides that were, you know, as you sort of identified, in, in essence, that very kind of slightly old school way of thinking about, well, this is what you should do and this is what's going on. And, yeah. and, and it was very linear, wasn't it? And, yeah, and, and now, quite paternalistic in a way, um, yeah. embarrassingly so. Uh, you know, and now you're tracking the city and its movements and its activities in, the, in a slightly mm. different way and for different people. Mm. Yeah, it's all the same thing for us anyway. Uh, we have a, a, a theory on cities, uh, which is that um, if you don't invest your time and your effort wisely, um, they will tend towards entropy. They will, they'll, they'll get worse. It's like a, a sandcastle on a beach. If you leave it overnight, it will not be there the next day. And it's the same with cities. And so we've chosen with our business to really um, quite intentionally and specifically um, invest our energy in making them better. And the thousand city guides that you referenced, which were yet yeah, an online guide that existed before social media, uh, were really our efforts in telling people, you have limited time, you have limited money. So let's try and help you spend this wisely because there is a difference in the experience that you will have if you go to a particular local cafe versus Gloria Jeans. But there's also a difference in the, the value of your money because it's generating local employment and hopefully be getting more cafes, the likes of which, you know, really kind of work for Melbourne at that time in a cultural and commercial level. Um, and, you know, that, that was the way that we started by just giving people polite advice on how to spend their time and money. Um, and now we're doing that at a different scale with government and property developers, trying to help them create places where people will spend their time and money. But really, it, to us, it seems the same thing. Um, like, yes, it's been a meandering journey, but fundamentally, we're trying to improve our cities by intervening in their growth and trying to stimulate the things that we think are sustainably good for cities and people. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, how, and, and so how do you think the, the journey of the city has progressed in the last, over the last decade? Um, At the moment in Australia with COVID, which is really like tiddlywinks COVID, we've hardly ha had any COVID really by global standards. There's this um, crazy like inner city affluent neighborhood delusion that because of the pandemic, everybody should move to regional Australia and, and that our cities will collapse. And I just think it's such crazy thinking and talk because cities are incredibly like seductive, intoxicating, essential places for us. Like we have built all of our infrastructure to get people there. All of our businesses are organized to be there. Most of our exciting social experiences happen there. And the idea that we would just kind of rip ourselves away from it and go and delocate in Byron Bay or whatever the kind of cliche, cliche is, is crazy. And what people who are sort of believing in that dream and not understanding is that the city is where opportunities are created. Um, anyone who lives in Byron Bay who's well off has made their money in the city and just kind of moved there um, mm -hmm. incidentally later in life. And so I think this kind of like cities um, are, are vitally important, like they're the generators of, of progress in our society and they are our best efforts to get along with each other en masse and it, like astonishing and interesting in that regard. And I think what's happened over the last 10 years to answer your question is that the city has slowly moved from a place where we just happen to live and work into a place where we live and work, but we really think about. And what I'm seeing is that really kind of positive shift away from thinking about cities purely in terms of like, what are my rights to the city? 
to a, a state of mind where we're thinking about our responsibilities for that city as well. And I think this is one of the positive things that's kind of come out of COVID is that in a really kind of um, physiological, obvious way, it has proven that we're all related. Like we're, we're not alone and we have to be aware of the people around us and how we behave and the implications of that. And we need to kind of get on um, as, a, as a species in close quarters. You know, we can't be isolationist in our ideas and we can't live far away from everyone else. And so I actually have a lot of faith that the city will endure. Um, and I'm really kind of proud of our efforts as society to move from being, oh yeah, it's a place where I live to it's a place that I understand and I'm proud of and I think of. Um, and, um, you know, I think the future for cities like everything else in the world is facing a very strange set of challenges at the moment, but they are just fantastic um, places that I, I think will, will always maintain a resonance and a relevance. And when are you running for mayor? <laughs> yeah, I have too many skeletons in my closet to, run, <laughs> to be in politics. <laughs> I actually, I'm pretty sure I did. I, I, did an, I did an audit of all of the awful things that I've done <laughs> um, and, been taken and I realized that um, politics is not for me. Yeah. Oh, well, no, uh, well, I will send you a copy of the transcript of what you've just said, because I, I, th yeah. I think you've, you've nailed it. Um, and I, I think you'll get voted. So um, <laughs> uh, skeletons aside, I don't think anyone will be paying any attention to those after they hear that impassioned plea for our cities, which oh, was absolutely fantastic. You. But I mean, we said we wouldn't talk about the coronavirus pandemic. But I think, yeah. it, as you've already touched on and alluded to, it's, it's almost impossible to talk about our life in a city without, a, yeah. you, know, you know, kind of thinking about the current situation we find ourselves in. But maybe if we try and push forward through that into what sits mm -hmm. on the other side, because obviously the, the, the work life sort of revolution to some extent, which is going on for many people in terms of uh, across the developed world and the developing world, you know, we have uh, people who private pr pr previously would have been desk bound now working yeah. from home in whatever circumstance that might be. but. I think finding um, a newfound freedom and a sense of autonomy in terms of how they structure their, uh, mm -hmm. their, their work-life balance. And it's gonna be very hard, I think, for a lot of employers to go back to how things were before, because mm -hmm. I think a lot of employees feel that they now have the right to, to determine to some extent how they work, where they work and when they work. Mm -hmm. um, what, what, what are your thoughts on that and the implications yeah. of that? Sure. Um, I think as a general statement about COVID, we are overestimating its impact in the short term and probably underestimating its impact in the long term and how that kind of plays out with work-life balance and work from home is that, you know, the first lockdown, um, everyone rushes home to do their work they discover that it's actually quite enjoyable. There are all of these, um, you know, experiences that they can have, which, uh, you know, in the realm of um, freedom and flexibility. And they tell their employers that they're happy um, working that way. Then a few weeks into the lockdown, things begin to turn and we realize that actually it's incredibly difficult for many people to work at home. Um, that the kind of rosy story you're told about it doesn't match the reality of a lot, a lot of people's lives, whether they have kids or the wrong design home for working at home or whatever the story is, maybe demands from their boss. And, and we see, you know, awful facts like in the US um, since lockdown, people are working 40% more time. So it's not like the time they've saved in travel, they're spending with their family or doing something enjoyable. They're just plowing it into work. And so there are these more kind of sinister, um, you know, second, um, second wave realizations uh, about the way that working at home um, affects us. And I think employers are kind of waking up to the fact that they maybe ask the wrong question. To ask someone are they happy working at home is not the same question as are you productive. Um, and so the the dream of working at home is now beginning to kind of erode. And I think people are realizing that the actual physical workplace had a lot of virtue that maybe was misunderstood. Um, and it, I agree with you that people might be reluctant to go back to the workplace five days a week. Um, and I think that employers will be challenged to accommodate this 
um, experience of flexibility. You know, it's a little bit like shopping. Most of us have tried new shopping techniques during COVID and they've generally been good. You know, all of a sudden our groceries, which we've been flapping about buying online, we did buy online, they arrived on time, they were great. We won't forget that and we will now do that going forward, even if we don't have to because of the pandemic. Um, I think with workplace, uh, even though we could be able to go into work physically, we might choose to work from home, but I don't think it's going to be more than like a marginal change on the way that we used to work pre-COVID. Um, and, and so I think there's an overestimation of the impact of COVID on the workplace of the future. Um, it really, I think the more interesting things kind of come down to the psychology of the disease, almost like a mental residue, which is left with you. When you've been in a situation where you're, instead of worrying about like whether you've got a nice set of abs, you're worried about whether you're going to get sick and die. Um, it really changes the way that you think about well-being and hygiene. You know, hygiene is a, is a verb. Like you want to see a workplace where hygiene is being actioned by people all the time. Yeah. And so there will be those long-term changes, but I don't think they're really going to be as um, significant as a lot of people are kind of claiming they will be. I'm not predicting the end of skyscrapers, um, and we have to kind of realize for, for CBDs particularly, there might be a big business that realizes 20% of its staff are happy to work from home. And so they, they lose two of their 10 floors in the skyscraper. But there's another business that's wanted to live in the, work in the CBD for a long time, waiting to take that distressed rent in space. And so the, the, the real effect will actually be inconsequential in terms of the number of people um, who are working in the city. It'll be the same number. Mm. <clears throat> but same but different. Same, well, um, more businesses, same yeah. number of workers. Smaller floor plates, same number of workers. Um, this is, cities will fill themselves up. Mm. We, we have um, structured our cities, our infrastructure, even capitalism all contributes to making sure that the CBD is this incredibly resilient place. Mm. I find that reassuring, um, you know, that you, you don't believe it's all doom and gloom for, for, for the city. No, and not for the workplace. I mean, sure, things will change. Like, absolutely, um, a lot of cities will, will try and develop hub and spoke models, and I think some of them will be successful. But even the cities with successful hub and spoke models um, is, will, will still have a very attractive CBD. Um, yeah. it's, you know, we'll, we'll probably get the best of both worlds, um, which I think is one of the nice things that happens in COVID. You know, like the, the basic product has to be put on ice for a while. You think of a new product um, and that turns out to go well. Um, and then COVID passes and you get to reintroduce your basic product and you've still got this new thing. Um, and for cities, they've got a great CBD. They'll have to develop some satellite sites. The CBD will become inhabitable again. Um, and the satellite sites will be this new kind of accoutrement. So it's yeah. just, COVID's a time machine. It's, it's just pushed us fast forward to address a whole lot of issues and to manifest a whole lot of changes, which we've seen coming for a while. Like you guys have been telling us for such a long time. Um, retailers, you need to be on the channel. Uh, shopping malls, you need to be mixed use. Airports, you need to be mixed use. Like all of these things we've been talking about for such a long time. Um, now uh, there's a mandate to either deliver them or to at least acknowledge them. Yeah, absolutely. Fascinating. Um, but, uh, oh, I will send you this transcript because you've, you've, you've said some really great things and I, but I feel like yeah, I've asked you lots of questions and maybe it's your turn to ask me a question. Yes. I have a question for you which has always fascinated me when I've thought of the work that you do. Um, and I don't know the answer to this question, which is why I'm asking you guys. I'm going to try it once because it's a nuanced question. <laughs> and if it doesn't work, you might have to do a, a take two or I choose a different question. Um, do you and Martin believe that the future is like a place on a map that we're all going to? Or is it an idea in our heads that we're creating and in turn it begins to create us? Mm, that's a genius question. And I think when I started on this journey mm. that's taken 20 years, I think I very much thought the, the, the former. Yeah. Um, 
And in fact, you know, if you think back to the methodology that we created, cultural triangulation that used cartography as its basis and the idea yeah. of wayfinding and the fact that yeah. this was about a map and it mm. was about a cultural positioning, that, that process of triangulation, which is that you use three points of reference in order to determine where you are on a map in order that you can then look at your trajectory, your fourth coordinate, the, pa the place mm -hmm. where you want to go. Mm -hmm. And so we very much used that 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 um, methodology as we still do, but all of that metaphorical language around wayfinding and maps and journeys. And so I, I think absolutely there was that sense that, that that was how we determined or defined this idea of the future, which I suppose within it has this notion of predetermination that it's it's yeah. it's it's already there and again maybe that's supported by the fact that we set the business off from that premise of william gibson the future has already happened mm -hmm. it just isn't very well distributed so again that would posit the idea that not that, it, that, that there's an element of fate but that but mm -hmm. that it's there and it's kind of set yeah. and it's about moving towards it and then somewhere along the journey of course we 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 changed as we knew the, the world was changing around us and as a result of that we stopped talking about trends because suddenly everyone was doing trends and we started to talk about strategy and then we also started to talk about foresight and we started to talk about helping businesses to make their future happen so that mm -hmm. with that change in language and that shift in focus there was there was the yeah. idea that in suddenly we weren't about predicting the future because the future wasn't ours to predict and nor could one really successfully do it. What we could do is give people, businesses, the tools to help them in corporate speak, mitigate risk because they yeah. were better prepared. But in some ways, I think, give them the knowledge and the insight to be able to make their future happen, for them to be far more in control, to be more autonomous about deciding what variables or variants of how the future might look they choose to um yeah. create and i mm -hmm. i think that that sense is is where we are now which is, is that we operate maybe on planes of the future and we we mm. allow ourselves the opportunity to determine how um it will become and how it will look and feel and i think that's a far more exciting place to be mm -hmm. um because it removes that sense that everything has been predetermined that yeah it's simply about finding yourself on the right path and then taking that path. I think it allows for that idea for you to, to, to move between mm. planes, almost between alternate universes, mm. uh, universes of, of possibility, mm. um, which I think is far more exciting. Yeah, I think that's a really lovely answer and it's confirmed my suspicion because I think I was so astonished by the first performance from the future laboratory that I saw, I walked away with this feeling of these, these guys know the future um, and they've just told us what it will be. And then the second time round, uh, when I was older and wiser and more critical, I thought, actually, I don't think that's what's going on. Um, there is a provocation here, which is useful for a person to think of their own idea, which in turn becomes their future. So it's not deterministic at all. Um, and, and I think that's a mm. far more exciting service for you guys to provide because it's really kind of liberating people's ideas and giving them, um, yes, there's research, uh, underlying it. But I think the other thing you provide is confidence because you've been doing what you've been doing for 20 yeah. years successfully. Um, and so they can step out into the unknown, um, with, yeah, with a little bit more kind of conviction. And so really the great thing that you guys have achieved at future laboratory is not what you've achieved, it's what your clients have achieved. Yeah, I think that's, I'm happy with that. Good, 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 good answer. Thank you. Pleasure, lovely chat. Thank you very, very much indeed. Mm -hmm.